Good. Okay, so we're talking about the, the rhetoric of wetlands because it's really, again, we're focusing on wetlands. Um, we're talking about restorations of all types, but we're really focusing on wetlands because wetlands really are um, the most robust types of restorations that we do in the US and our thinking is the most complex and our experience is the longest um, in, a, in a modern experimental aggressive restoration sense um, than just about anywhere else. Um, so, so we've talked a little bit about restoration, a concept of restoration. Now we're gonna move on to talking about wetlands for a bit and then we'll get back to talking about uh, wetland restoration and restaurant, restoration in general for the rest of the semester. But before we get to the wetland ecology, um, because of the strong um, uh, societal impressions that we have from wetlands and, and truly really intense uh, impressions that have evolved over the years, unlike almost all of our other ecosystems, the beach, grasslands, forest, we pretty much have, you know, things have changed here and there, but they haven't changed massively. With wetlands, they've undergone full 180 degree um, flips and and uh, and changes and so want to make sure we understand that because a lot of times we bring this rhetorical baggage with us I do you do we all do when we come to these um, topics and so we want to examine that uh, first today before we get on to other stuff so we're going to talk a little bit about seeing wetlands rhetoric of wetlands oh man rhetoric okay great uh, and then we'll talk about how other people see wetlands and feel the dreams. We'll see how, how much time we have, see how long um, we go today. If not, we'll just spin it off until next time. First thing I want to say about wetlands, and you, you may recall this from some of your readings, but wetlands are one of our systems that we typically define. Oh, it's like a you guys got a question? It's all good. Um, so, uh, so most things, grasslands, forests, woodlands, we have a, a pretty clear definition ecologically of what those things are and, and a pretty clear uh, concept of what those things are. Wetlands are, are different. Wetlands we define by what they are not. So I usually call wetlands not systems. So here's some examples. So if we talk about, on the left, we're talking about uh, wetland systems. Um, and, uh, if we're talking about the systems, they're not fully terrestrial. They're not fully aquatic. They tend to be, um, extreme, extremely, uh, you know, uh, 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 temperature wise, uh, uh, redox wise, other things. They tend to be fairly extreme. They don't tend to be, um, necessarily, um, super mellow, easy to live in places. Uh, critters need specific adaptations to deal with. Um, and while wetlands can be very diverse in the aggregate, on a, on a per unit scale, they're not necessarily the most diverse systems that we have. They're not, um, uh, the, the, they're, they're very productive and, and actually our most, either our most or tied for the most productive ecosystems we have on the planet in terms of the amount of biomass they produce, the amount of carbon they fix per unit area for time, but they don't, but on that same uh, uh, unit area, they're not necessarily the most diverse. Um, so, so those are all knots, right? If we talk about how our society has viewed wetland, we tend to see them as what we cannot do with them. So they're not buildable, right? Um, we can't easily walk through them. So we can't easily traverse through them with the car, hiking, whatever, they're muddy, um, our, our feet tend to stick and we, we twist our ankles and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, we also tend to view them as not healthy places. Historically, primarily because of um, mosquito-borne diseases, we tend to think of wetlands as being full of threat, full of, of illness um, and, and those types of things. And because of all this, because they're not terrestrial, not aquatic, not buildable, our society historically has viewed wetlands as not usable. And from a utilitarian perspective, particularly in the early part of our country, 
Um, if they weren't usable, they were a waste. So we have terms like reclamation that emerge from these perceptions. Reclamation, rec you know, the root of that is reclaiming. In other words, um, we're taking back from nature or from uh, an unusable state and putting them into a usable state. The Romans were, in the Western world at least, the Romans were the first to large scale destroy wetlands because they saw them as a waste and they saw them as a threat. So they started active, um, you know, governmental policies drain the water from wetlands and turn them from a, from a wetland type environment to more of a terrestrial type environment. And that was all seen as a, as a beautiful, positive thing. That notion of reclamation has persisted well into um, this, the last century around the world. Okay, so let's start talking about some of the rhetoric. Let's look at this. In a few minutes, you guys are going to do an exercise, but I wanted to at least start with a little um, very brief, very abbreviated tour of wetland rhetoric. Um, uh, first, the, the image on top, this is one of my um, most favorite images of New Orleans, historic New Orleans. Um, this is a large panel painting. This, this, is, this is from uh, the mid early actually 1700s. Dr. A. Really quick, yeah. You're Are not you sharing your, sharing your screen? Oh my God. Oh my God. You're painting a mental no, picture. I'm not. Oh geez. All right. Great. Thanks team. Holy cow. Okay, you guys good? Can you see us now? Yeah. Man, good. what a rookie move. Man, it's such a rookie. Oh, my God. Okay, so we're going to talk about uh, wetland uh, rhetoric and stuff today. We're going to go over all this stuff. Um, wetlands are not systems. This is what I had up before when I was talking. You guys were kindly just letting me blab, blab on as if I'm some nerdy professor or something. So, yeah, so here we go. So wetlands, not systems, right? They're not terrestrial. They're not aquatic. They tend to not be mild. Um, tend to not be species rich. From a societal perspective, they tend to be not buildable, not easily traversed. Um, and because of the mosquito thing we mentioned, they tend to be not healthy. And all that burbles down into our society historically viewing them as not being usable. Cool. Everybody can see this, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Thanks for telling me yeah. that. You guys. Okay. Um, so, all right. So, uh, here we go. Now everybody can see this. Now, now everybody can know what I'm talking about. Um, so uh, this top panel is uh, an image of the city of New Orleans when it was um, very young. So um, we are standing uh, south of the city of New Orleans and looking northwards. Now, if you guys have not been there before or haven't taken my New Orleans class, this might be a little bit confusing, but basically um, what we're seeing right here, this, this uh, sort of green, green shiny thing, that's the Mississippi River. It's flowing from the left over here to the right, and then it's going to go down to the Gulf of Mexico. So our, this perspective, our back is facing the Gulf of Mexico, so we're looking northwards. So we're looking across the Mississippi River, and we're looking into, um, uh, this is, uh, you guys have all heard of the French Quarter, this is the French Quarter. Jackson Square, this is the historic, uh, the Vucure, the old square, the old city. And what we see is, uh, and sorry, and then this part in, in front of it, just to finish the orientation, this whiteness, this is Lake Pontchartrain. It's actually technically not a lake, it's a big bay, an extension of the ocean, but everybody thinks it's a lake. And so, so this is um, a big uh, water body north of the city of New Orleans. So the city of New Orleans, resides on this little chunk of land, little spit of land between the river flowing through and this uh, ocean embayment uh, to the north. Cool? So we just have a look at it. What do we see? And it's, it might be a little small on your screen, but, but it's important to have the whole perspective here. So all this stuff here, all this, all this uh, 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 spickled kind of greenish thing, that represents all the forested wetland. So that is all the Cypress Swamp. That is all the area that was here before Europeans came in and started settling this area. 
Um, so what, what we've done is you can tell here, they've chopped down the trees, right? They've carved out from the wilderness, as it were, um, a settlement. On the bank in front of us, if we look on, on this bank, you see the same thing going on. So it's, the figures might be a little small, but, but suffice it to say, you can tell what they're doing is chopping down these trees, right? Chopping down these trees, burning these trees, clearing this area, uh, getting ready to farm it. Um, uh, the point being that, that the, the value of this wetland, the, the worth of this land is in the clearing of it, is in the, the transforming it from the state it was in before to this new state. And that, that could be either farming, that could be a commerce, you know, whatever, but, but whatever it is, the old state is um, in need of humans tweaking it. Now, as we mentioned, uh, as, as mentioned a second ago, I'm going to play a, a quick uh, three-minute story here for you. Um, but one of the reasons that we cleared wetlands was to turn into a better use, right? So that's because it was hard, for example, to farm in this big, in this big uh, 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 forest, let's say, right? So, so we had to change it. The other major reason why people were interested in in transforming wetlands be was because they sim it simply seemed a threat to them, a, a manifest danger. And so that's what we see here. So here we have um, this notion of leeches. So just walk, if we walked through the wetland and we got our legs in the water, a lot of times you'd have leeches that would sort of suck your blood. And that was, oh my God, scary. Um, they weren't necessarily a threat to you, but, but people perceive that. And then of course, mosquitoes. So this image right here is um, a, uh, uh, engraving from the 1800s, and this is of New Orleans of one of the many yellow fever outbreaks. Yellow fever, a, a mosquito-borne disease, and uh, just a very uh, dangerous place. So I'm going to click this, and we're going to play a quick three-minute news clip here. Is in full haunting season, but the city of New Orleans... Can you guys hear that? Yes. yes. Okay, good. So this is screaming for being haunted all year round. This goes back to the 1800s when a yellow fever virus wiped out tens of thousands of New Orleanians. Leah Danella of NPR's Code Switch team has our story. If you get your history lessons from Netflix, you might think New Orleans is haunted because of witches, like on American Horror Story Coven. You are a witch. I can smell the stink of it only. Well, I didn't expect you to like me. If you're more into the travel channel, you might think it was all the swamps. Places that are surrounded by water somehow contributes to this very bizarre phenomenon that we call ghosts. But if you were around between 1817 and 1905, there's a good chance you'd say New Orleans was haunted by death. In epidemic years, the yellow fever virus could wipe out up to 10% of the city's population. It was spread by mosquitoes, and in the summer of 1853, it killed nearly 8,000 people. The virus earned New Orleans the nickname Necropolis, City of the Dead, and it wasn't a pretty way to die. Victims experienced jaundice, so they sort of turned yellow. That's Catherine Oliverius. She's a professor at Stanford who studies the history of yellow fever. She says yellow fever would lead to chills, nausea, headaches, fever, convulsions, delirium. Oliverius says it was a disease that turned holy men away from God. Even pious victims screamed profanities as the end neared. About half of people who got yellow fever would die from it. You might think all this death was keeping people away from New Orleans, but actually people were flocking there. Oliverius says it was like the antebellum Silicon Valley. It was the place where if you were an ambitious white man, you went to make your fortune. That was because of slavery, the cotton industry, and New Orleans' strategic location on the Mississippi River. But Oliverius says that there were only a handful of people who made it in New Orleans. Most people never were able to break into the sort of upper echelons of society. And so you have people quite literally arriving in a death trap. Today, there's a vaccine for yellow fever, but back then, the only way to get immunity from the disease was to survive it. Still, 
there were tons of myths and misinformation floating around. That people who eat a lot of tomatoes will get yellow fever, or people who eat too much fruit will get yellow fever. Another widespread myth, that you couldn't get yellow fever if you were black. Oliverius says prominent doctors spread the lie that black people were naturally immune to the disease. And she says that lie was used to justify slavery. If black people are naturally resistant to yellow fever, therefore black slavery is natural, even humanitarian, because it protects white people from spaces and labor that would kill them. But here's the thing, even if they didn't want to admit it, many people knew that black folks weren't immune. At slave markets, few people were willing to buy a person who wasn't already acclimated to yellow fever. So you're dealing with a Gordian knot of contradictions that all ended up furthering the cause of white supremacy and the expansion of racial slavery. Yellow fever. It killed thousands, terrified even more, and was a long-standing tool of white supremacy. How's that for a horror story? Leah Danella, NPR News. Okay, so, um, so all of that is coming from the fact that people, um, th that these mosquitoes are dwelling in the swamp, right? And so we see this over and over again. People recognize the danger, and when we want to deal with wetlands, we usually put um, the most disenfranchised, the most disempowered members of our society closest to the wetlands. Uh, and when we, when we want to go transform those wetlands, it's usually those same folks, slaves, poor folks, uh, immigrants, whatever, that are tasked with going into doing the clearing of the trees or, or whatever. Um, now, uh, uh, we, there's all kinds of threats, and, and, and we've perceived threats from wetlands um, as a society for some time. So disease is obviously a huge one. The other, or another one, is the unpredictability of flooding. This would be on, along riparian corridors, and this would be along coastal zones. So this image here is from Florida. So we're looking at the, the Everglades, something we'll talk about later, is massive um, so-called sea of grass, this incredible ecosystem that we've trashed um, in, in Florida. Um, and what we're, what we're looking at here is it looks, so the hur um, a, big, a big flood has come through. And what we're looking at looks to be a fire, and it is a fire, but it's not a fire of, uh, of buildings burning. That's people burning. So that's a, a funeral pyre, basically, of, and I can't remember off the top of my head, I want to say it's about 26, 28 people being burned um, that have died because of the flooding. So these are folks that were living uh, in or near this wetland system. And because we didn't understand necessarily the cycles or we couldn't predict rainfall patterns, people would frequently get flooded. And back in the day, um, this could lead to people drowning and dying. So, so in places like Belle Glade, Florida, the wetlands were very, perceived as very sinister, right? It's not just the disease, it's also the physical threat that they could you know, well up in the middle of the night and, and drown you and your family, for example. Other examples of some of our perceptions of wetlands through time. So up here on the left, this is 1913. This is uh, just outside Yale University, I think this is, Yale University. And what are these guys doing? They have a canister. Any guesses as to what those guys are squirting out of the canister? Pesticides. Uh, good guess, but no. Perfect. I would have guessed the same thing. Like DEET? Uh, nope. It's not 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 a not a insecticide per se. Kerosene or gasoline? Yes, it's oil. They're spraying oil across. So so it's a little hard to see, but if you look, we we can see that they're the guy's knees are about here, and so he's in about you know I don't know a foot two feet of of grass and really his feet are in water. So they're in this seasonal wetland or, or this, this salt marsh. You can see here there's buildings behind them and so there, there's high lands behind these guys and they're going and this is just a can of oil. So they've pumped the can to pressurize it and they're just spraying a, sheen, a little mister here. They're doing a sheen of oil everywhere um, across the whole wetland. And, and, and why, why would they want to do that? Guesses burn it. can't lay their eggs. Mosquitoes, right. So mosquitoes. So what they're doing is, so this area is full of mosquitoes because it's a wetland, right? We talked about this as threat. And so one way to deal with the threat of mosquitoes, so what mosquitoes do is um, uh, they lay their eggs. Their eggs turn into larvae. Their larvae are like this, right? Like my hand right here. 
So they're, they're in the water. My other hand's the surface of the, of the pond and they have a little breathing tube that sticks up into the air. So as they're, as they're growing, as they're maturing underwater, they're able to breathe air. What they're doing here is spraying oil, which is gonna change the surface tension. And so whereas if we were to do a really close microscope look at the mosquito's breathing tube, we'd see that the water was making a little bit of a funnel so that it could breathe air. That oil changes the surface tension and makes it such that they can't keep the water out of their funnel and they drown. So it's a physical way to control um, insect populations as opposed to a chemical or pesticide type way. So these guys are just walk around their wetlands spraying oil. Probably, you know, nowadays we wouldn't say that's maybe the best thing in the world, but that's what happened back in the day. Um, uh, let's see, to the right, the, the upper right panel, this is, any guesses as to where this is? There's a clue from the year on there. No clues, no guesses? Somebody take a stab, take a random stab. What picture are you talking about? So the picture on the upper right, this one right here, this 1851 run right here. Beaumont, Texas. Beaumont, Texas, bold guess, no. Cl much closer to home than, than, uh, than Texas. San Francisco? San Francisco is exactly correct. So we're, we are, in um, essentially downtown San Francisco, looking eastward. The San Francisco Bay is right in front of us. We see some buildings, right? We see some, some, some old buildings in, in you know, frontier town kind of thing. But as we get closer, what do we see right here? We see a bunch of what look like uh, a toothpicks, or if you're, if you're looking at watching our lecture on a, your iPhone, it might look like little lines, but, but uh, these are all masts, the masts of schooners. Right, sailing. I ship. thought they were all oil rigs. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's insane. Look, I mean, look at. I can't, couldn't even begin to start counting. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirty, forty, fifty, sixty, seventy. I mean, you know, hundreds, hundreds, and hundreds. Almost all of these ships are abandoned. So this is 1851. This is the start of the gold rush, right? Uh, uh, if, you, if you can't remember that, right? The San Francisco 49ers, right? Football team, right? 49ers, silver gold. So 19 or 1850, people start coming in and they really start coming in in 1851. So what, what would happen, we'll talk about this when we get to talking about the San Francisco Bay, but, but suffice it to say, these, these vessels sailed in and almost everybody left. Captain, uh, 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 first mate, cooks, everybody. And they just ran to the Sierras to get rich quick as they thought would happen. So you have these huge, massive um, uh, abandonment of, of sailing vessels. Um, uh, in this, this, flood, you know, this area, so this is a, a, a tidal bay. And so typically, you know, you'd wait for the tide to come up, you'd sail your ship in, offload your gear, and then get out before the, or equipment or supplies or whatever, before the tides changed. These people just left their boats. And so the boats became stranded essentially in the wetland. And so if we go to um, the, the downtown now of San Francisco, this is where the downtown is. Downtown is not here. Well, I mean, there's, there's city here, of course, but, but the main um, uh, market street, the main financial district, what we call it of San Francisco, is all right here. So the financial district is built on these dead ships. Um, so, so, um, so little did we care about wetlands, we just left our vessels there, for example. Okay. Over here, this picture here, lower left, uh, 1880. This is um, uh, on the shores of one of our great lakes. And this is, the title of this was One Day's Hunting. So check this out. There are uh, ducks, 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 ducks. There are all kinds of other waterfowl. There's some geese hanging over here. Um, now granted, there's several, several people here and lots of guns, but look at that. That's one day, that's one, one you know, few hours of hunting. That is how productive our wetlands were, right? Mass support, huge, very productive systems, incredibly productive systems, produce huge numbers of fish, huge numbers of insects, huge numbers of, of birds, either resident birds or migratory waterfowl. So, you know, wetlands, very, very productive. And so um, while they were oftentimes perceived as a threat, 
they're also seen a, a, as a place to, to harvest uh, food, for example, and also um, a, a structural material for buildings, so thatched roofs and, and things of that nature. Okay, one more, and then we'll get on to our, our, our next uh, examples here. But um, this is, uh, you know, again, uh, hurricanes, dangerous hurricanes. Again, we talked about flooding and, oh my gosh, wetlands are so dangerous and blah, 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 blah. And so um, one of the things that, that we get from our um, uh, 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 threats from the, the physical threat of flooding is this notion in the early 1900s of resurgent America, engineering America, building America. Hey, and, and especially in the wake of the Great Depression, when we had the Civilian Conservation Corps and all these efforts to put people to work, one of the things we're going to do is start intensely manipulating the water systems of the United States. And we do that through various things, but in particular through building dams. And so we're building dams, you know, to provide power, we're building dams to provide water for farmers. But one of the initial key selling points, what, what, what convinces um, and gets the buy-in from Americans is this notion that nature is dangerous, wetlands are dangerous, we need to control how water moves in our country. So therefore we need to have dams so we can, we can control how much water goes when. Um, and so that's, uh, this is a, a, an ad promoting um, um, a dike in Florida and, and the Mississippi. Now, um, those are the historic views of wetlands. There's always people, there's always been people that love wetlands and you know, the romantics and all this kind of stuff could see the beauty in it, but in various civilizations. Stuff. But nevertheless, in, in our popular American culture, it, it really began to shift uh, more like in the 60s, 70s. And this is an example from, uh, I think it was referenced in, in one of the chapters you guys read already the other week. Um, but uh, this is one of my most favorite ones, which is uh, The Creature from the Black Lagoon. So uh, 1950s movie, right? It's all the tropes of all this stuff. So, you know, it's damsel in distress, woman can't possibly save herself, the dude has to say, all that kind of stuff. But at its core, the story is about, uh, centers on, this so-called black lagoon, this dark part of, in this case, a river, and mysteriousness, right? Danger comes from the wetland. It's, it's unseen. It's black. It's, it's opaque. We, we don't know what's in it. Threat comes from, danger comes from the wetland. And we have to fight it by all our modern technology and all the crap that comes along with that, right? On the right is only a few years later, only, uh, so this is in the 1950s, Creature of the Black Loom. Swamp Thing comes out in the 1970s, um, the, first edi the first version of this. And Swamp Thing is now, um, a, a, you know, obviously it's a comic book cartoon. But um, here, what's happening is um, from the wetland comes a hero. So from the wetland comes Swamp Thing, who's essentially birthed by um, some evil polluters dumping toxic, toxic waste and it, and it creates Swamp Thing. But the key part here is, is there's also a monster in this story, but the monster that comes from the, the swamp, from the wetland, is a sa saving force. Um, battles uh, developers that want to chop down the trees. Battles polluters that want to degrade the water quality and that kind of stuff. So that's a huge shift. Now, now, was everybody in the world watching Swamp Thing? No. But the very fact that this could be produced and begun to be sold and consumed shows that we we're beginning to experience a different understanding at the cultural level of what wetlands are or wetlands could be. Questions about that so far? Okay, we're gonna watch a couple of videos and then we'll get into our exercise. So this first video I wanna show you is from, I'm just gonna show you an excerpt. You're, I'll post on our, on our lectures uh, page um, the full uh, the full video and it, it's worth watching. It's only the full video is only about 29 minutes or so, so it's not that long. But we're just going to watch a, few, a couple minutes of it. This is um, George H. W. Bush, the first President Bush, um, in his. Uh, so he was for those of you that don't remember or weren't alive or whatever, he was the Vice President for Ronald Reagan. Uh, and then Reagan serves two terms. And then, you know, was obviously termed out of office. And so his, his vice president, George Bush here, 
is campaigning for the presidency. And so this is one of his campaign stops where he spoke about environmental policy. And again, I would encourage you guys to go watch this uh, whole thing. Let's see if we can pause this. Um, it's, it's just very interesting um, to look at this now. Okay, so I'm gonna play uh, just an excerpt from you. Creating I wanna, new weapons. Excuse me. I wanna start here. We have some so you guys, you guys can hear this okay? Extremely able public servants. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so we just listen. So we're talking about the environmental policy that he wants to enact. That point. And I might single out EPA's administrator, Lee Thomas. He is doing a superb job. He's a good person. But lest there be any doubt about my own intention to vigorously execute our environmental laws, I'll make this following commitment to you today. I will appoint the finest, most I lost it. individuals in the land to serve in the Environmental Protection Agency. They will have my support. They will have my ear. They will have my confidence. And they will have my mandate, go after the polluters. And just... I was told, getting ready for this appearance, that um, just a few miles from here is a marvelous environmental success story. Point Moulier, the wetlands. I don't have to tell those of you who are hunters and fishermen how important the wetlands are as a habitat for fish and ducks and geese and other waterfowl. But they also help control flooding by serving as a sponge and they help recycle Recycle water by filtering out wastes. And wetlands are a vital environmental and recreational resource, and they are at risk. We've been losing wetlands at a rate of almost half a million acres every year. Although this should be reduced with the uh, conservation-oriented swamp buster provisions that were in, the, in, the, uh, in last year's farm bill. Much of the loss comes from inevitable pressure for development and many of our wetlands are on private property. But I believe we've got to act. We must bring the private and public sectors together at the local and state levels to find ways to conserve wetlands. One state has a policy called no net loss. No net loss of wetlands. And it's worked through mitigating the effects of development, preserving wetlands where possible, and sometimes, as you're doing right here, I'm told, creating new wetlands. That state is not a no growth, head in the sand, no development state. I want to be clear on that point. The state has a, a no net loss policy, yet it's a booming state. I believe this should be our national goal, no net loss of wetlands. We can't afford... We can't afford to lose the half of America's wetlands that still remains. I want to increase the recreational opportunities provided by the great American outdoors. And in that task, I'll pay special attention to the condition and the management of our parks. I think they're doing pretty well. We can always do better. I'll look for ways to expand them. To okay. So, um, so again, a very interesting speech. I encourage you guys to watch the whole thing um, when I post it. Um, but that was the introduction at the, at the national level um, by the person that would soon become president of the United States um, of this concept of no net loss, which has remained our policy um, ever since, you know, for the, for the 35 odd years since. Um, and so that might seem strange to some of you coming from a, a Republican uh, president who maybe um, in recent years, our Republican presidents haven't been the strongest environmental uh, advocates. But um, uh, uh, I would point out to you that, that many of our strong environmental laws came from, envir from uh, Republican presidents, um, from Roosevelt to um, Nixon that created the EPA, et cetera. So, so um, when we talk about rhetoric, it's very interesting how groups that we now perceive as, as speaking one way or perceiving a resource one way 
um, they weren't necessarily always that way. 